Hi, I'm Dr. James Johnson. I am also known as the Floater Doctor. So uh, for those of you who are not aware of me, I am a, an eye surgeon, an ophthalmologist, um, and I've been in practice for quite some time. The last almost 15 years, my practice has been exclusively addressing and treating bothersome eye floaters. And it's been a great practice. I've helped a lot of people. It has also been frustrating. Uh, it has been frustrating because uh, it's not as efficient as I would like. It takes more treatments than I would like. Uh, I, would, I, I wish I could get 100% and, and uh, with the sort of compulsive tendencies that I have, you know, it's very frustrating because I want to get more and I want, as well as the patients as well. But it's also been very frustrating because there are many people who are just not candidates for treatment. Particularly the younger patients. Uh, they are just generally not good candidates for treatment with the laser because very often their floaters are very small, very microscopic, um, and more importantly, they're located very, very close to the retina. And it's interesting also because there just really isn't a correlation between the bothersomeness, the subjective awareness, the bothersomeness of the floater, uh, and, the, and the amount, volume, mass of the proteins that cause the floaters. Uh, in fact, uh, the patients that are probably the most bothered in, in the history of my practice, the patients that are the most bothered by their floaters have been this younger age group that uh, really have floaters that are very difficult to find on examination. Now that's not a critique of the patient. Um, in fact, one of the aphorisms and sayings that I've come, that I've come up with over the years, I have many, uh, one of them is the floaters don't have to be very big to be bothersome. They just have to be bothersome. And for some of these microscopic little aggregated little clumps of proteins, that is their floaters, uh, because of the location close to the retina, their shadows are very distinct, very defined, uh, very often in their central field of vision, uh, swirling by, moving by, these little nests of uh, tangled, uh, little nests of, of shadows moving across their vision. These patients are the most depressed, despondent, uh, the most upset about their floaters. I get it. But again, it's been frustrating because nobody wants to be a medical care provider and then have to say, I can't do anything for you. But that is probably the most common experience of these younger patients, or actually you know, many patients with floaters of all age groups, but particularly the younger patients. Um, it's one thing to look in maybe an older person's eye and you, 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 you dilate and you take a look in there and you're like, ah, oh, there's a prominent floater, there's a large floater, there's a big cloud, you know, obvious to see. Now whether that doctor will choose to do anything or address it, that's a different story. But at least you can see it, you can say, oh, there is that thing. But the younger patients, and, and this is true, and I'm looking, and you know, I am the floater doctor, I am looking for these things, and very often I can't find them. But I know they're there, I know nobody's making this stuff up, you know, it is real, it's legit, um, and it has just been very, very frustrating. Frustrating for me, I can only imagine how frustrating it is for the floater sufferer who has gone to a few different doctors, the doctors all kind of marginalize them, uh, these patients feel sort of disenfranchised from the advances of medicine. They don't even really feel like their problem is being taken seriously. I take it serious, seriously, but you know, I have to know my limitations with the laser. I have to be very good at what I do, but maybe just as important, I need to know what not to treat and what to walk away from. And so this younger group, uh, I have been a bit discouraging. Uh, a bit pessimistic with them. I've gone through periods of time and frustration where I just said, you know what, I I'm just not even gonna see them. I'm just gonna not even see younger patients again because it's just so frustrating for me and I just can't treat them and I don't want them to waste their money. I want them to fly cross country uh, or, or internationally just so I can say, yeah, can't treat you. That's not fair to them and uh, the small amount of, amount of money that I would get from the consultation uh, does not offset the, the, the right thing to do. Now, this may be changing. Not that there's any great big change in devices or technology, um, but I'm, I will announce in a moment here a, a new program uh, for my practice. So, but before I get into that, let me talk a little bit sort of generally about medicine. You know, I, I think there's probably this sense that uh, medicine is sort of a top-down thing, like there are these uh, scientists in, in laboratories sort of inventing things and coming up with these devices. and um, you know, or from the device manufacturers, and that kind of trickles down uh, into the practices and generally gets sort of accepted. Sometimes, though, it is kind of more of a grassroots from the bottom up. Uh, it could be from uh, a, a, an engineer or, or a scientist or somebody uh, who, who has a personal interest. There's a movie, Lorenzo's Oil, where a family, you know, invented this sort of nutritional supplement for their boy who had uh, metabolic disorders. Um, 
and sometimes it's from um, uh, a small cadre of, uh, of doctors who might be trying to do something different. Um, I have kind of put myself into that category as one of the pioneers in the use of lasers to treat eye floaters. And again, my practice is the only one that has been doing this exclusively for 15 years. So I feel like, you know, I'm kind of in that category. And I kind of, I kind of dig the rebelliousness of doing something that many of my uh, maybe smarter, more professorial um, uh, colleagues will say, oh, that can't be done. You can't do that. It's like, well, you know, I've been doing it. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not the most efficient process in the world, but I've been doing it and having good success with it. So, so I can't take credit for this, but you know, I still learn a lot from you know perusing the internet, you know, Googling, YouTube, this or that, and uh, you know, I have my own little addiction to Reddit. But one of those is I do lurk and and read through and occasionally contribute to the eye floaters uh, Reddit subreddit, and. Um, I noticed that there was some chatter and some talk uh, from people who've had some good experiences using low-dose atropine. And it really caught and kind of piqued my interest because I thought, huh, it absolutely makes sense. And unlike some of the other things that, that some of the other conjecture and, and, uh, and other things that people have been sort of uh, optimistically and hoping for, you know, this makes sense from a physics and optics standpoint. And that is uh, mild dilation of the pupil which would diminish the bothersomeness and the subjective awareness of eye floaters. Totally makes sense. And many patients who've had their eyes, pupils dilated, the eyes dilated at their eye examination, they're like, yeah, for a few hours it was really nice because I didn't see my floaters. Big blown out pupils. Well, having huge, massive, huge pupils is problematic uh, because it, it kind of, it, there's a little bit of social weirdness about it. If you see someone with big blown out pupils, it's like, are they on drugs? You know, what's going on? So there's that. Um, but also having big pupils like that does make you much more sensitive to light. So there's a trade-off of a little bit of a relief from the floaters, but then you have so much photophobia and so much sensitivity light, it's really unacceptable. In addition, especially for younger patients, when you dilate the pupils like that, you also paralyze their ability to see up close. So the trade-offs of, trade of having your pupils uh, widely dilated, uh, you might get relief from some, but the, the, the trade-off uh, from that is, is just totally unacceptable. But um, low-dose atropine, it's interesting. So there are basically three different types of drops that can be used to dilate the pupils in maybe four. Three of one category. Um, they, affect, they affect the parasympathetic system. Uh, there is atropine, which has actually been around for thousands of years. It's a plant extract from um, um, a nightshade family, and uh, belladonna would be the most, um, the most classic example of the, the origins from it. So we would see atropine, we would see cyclogil, and tropicamide. Tropicamide is what we usually use in our offices because it has about a two or three hour uh, duration. Um, it dilates the pupils wildly, but it doesn't last that long. So you can dilate, you can get a good look in there, do what you need to do, send them home. By that evening, they're doing just fine. Uh, cyclogil has a much longer lifespan uh, or, or life you know, um, effect in the, in the body, two or three days maybe. And then there's the gold standard atropine, which can last for several days and in some cases maybe even up to a couple weeks. Well, that's problematic. It does have some very specific indications. Uh, that is, um, sometimes if you need to, if you think, suspect that a child, a toddler, even an infant, is uh, having some visual problems, maybe they're very, very nearsighted or very, very farsighted, their eyes are crossed, you need to get a really good objective refraction from them. Well, you know, you, you put a, a toddler in your chair, you can't say which is better, choice one, choice two, choice one, choice two, it doesn't work for them. But if you dilate the pupil and absolutely paralyze their focusing ability, you can rely on some other techniques to get a pretty close, if, you're, if you do it a lot, the, the pediatric ophthalmologist, you can get a pretty close refraction from them, at least find out if they are farsighted and need some help, and that can give them some relief from their, from their cross eye. Uh, also, uh, for people that have very uh, severe inflammation in the eye, uveitis would be the term for that. Um, with severe inflammation, you can get, the, the tissues can get very sticky, and you can have the pupil, um, I'm sorry, the iris adhere and scar to the underlying lens. That's a problem. So you, you, you put these long-lasting, very powerful dilating agents in there to open up the pupil so that you don't get that adhesion. Uh, so that's a very specific indication. Um, not much else. Not much else that it would be used for. 
And that's uh, the, the standard commercial dose is 1%, 1% atropine. That's how it comes in the bottle. So there's a modification of that, a custom compounding of those drops um, by a hundredfold and drop it down to 0.01% atropine. Now with that, you get a much milder dilation. You know, you get that, that people will dilate maybe a millimeter, maybe a couple millimeters or so, which is not going to be all that noticeable, especially if you have dark eyes, but it's not going to be all that noticeable to others. Um, very importantly is you don't get the, uh, the sensitivity to light because you don't have the big blown out pupil and it doesn't knock out, it's too weak to really knock out your focusing and accommodative effort so you can still work up close on computers, on your phone or whatever. So I heard about this and I thought, well, this is interesting. I started looking into it and, and finding some articles of how um, atropine, even at full strength, has been used long term in children to prevent the progression of myopia. Again, compliance with that is very, very difficult because of these uh, side effects that I mentioned. Um, but it is considered to be safe to be used in children at the full dose, long term daily use. So by diluting that down and doing some custom compounding of that, um, you get the, the, the benefits of the slight dilation of the pupil uh, without the side effects. How does that work? Well, let me show you. So we jumped over here real quick because I want to use this whiteboard here to demonstrate how the pupil dilation works with, uh, with floaters. So um, if you've done your research, a lot of this is review, but basically, you know, cross section of the eye. And what we have is our optics up front, and we have in red here the neurosensory retina. That's basically the film or the sensor of the camera. And the vitreous is, fills up this whole space right here. Ideally, preferentially, that vitreous will be optically transparent and clear. And what the floaters are, are some sort of uh, uh, um, density, cloud, linear strand and fiber, something in that space. Now, if you have a density there, even though we say you're seeing floaters, you're not actually seeing floaters, uh, any density within that space has the potential for casting a shadow onto the retina. So you don't actually see the floater proper. What you are aware of, subjective aware of, is the shadow. Okay? And there's lots of variables that affect how you see your floaters. Um, one of the most important is the size of the pupil. Now the pupil is this aperture right in here. It, nor it opens and closes in response to the amount of light. Generally, in a bright light environment like this, pupils should be very, very, very small. So if you have a small pupil and some sort of floater right here, light is entering uh, fairly coherently and tends to cast a pretty distinct, pretty defined, sharp shadow. If on the other hand, you open up that pupil larger, light is coming in from a larger area, and uh, the shadow on the trailing side, on the shadow side of that, will tend to be more cone-shaped. Light coming in from this side, creates a shadow, light coming in from this side, kind of undoes that, and you get a trailing shadow. And especially some of the smaller floaters may have a relatively small uh, trailing shadow, and you may not see them. Um, this one, you, may, you might still see, but the, the shadow would be much more diminished. So the idea of dilating the pupil even slightly is to change the way that those shadows are cast onto the retina. This, this program of dilating the pupil to get symptomatic relief doesn't change the floater itself. It doesn't change the size, the density, the location, the movement. It doesn't change any of that. But it does change your perception of those floaters. So that's how uh, dilating the pupil, that's how the dilation of the pupil changes your perception of the floaters. Um, eh, it's more complicated than that, but that's all we need to know, and we'll get back over to, uh, to uh, the rest of the, of the presentation. So, so on to the, to the gist of the matter, is, is I'm uh, starting a new program through my website and through my practice uh, to do telemedicine conferences, basically like Zoom or Skype video conferences, um, uh, consultations to meet uh, with the patient, get an idea of their problem, uh, you know, uh, look at drawings, pictures, you know, get an idea, uh, understand their medical history, just to make sure that they're a good candidate um, or a fair candidate for at least a trial. After that's done, I will mail out a sample. Now, it's a sample, but uh, it, there's enough in there to treat both eyes every day. It's a once a day drop. Um, and by the way, it doesn't have to be used every day. It could be used just on work days and the weekends not so much or vice versa. It could be used basically ad lib or when you want to. 
Um, so that sample will be enough to treat both eyes for about a month or so, as long as you're not wasting it all over the place. Uh, some people are a little erratic with their eye drops. Um, and uh, that'll be part of the fee for the consultation. Send that out to you, and then it gives you a chance to try it. Now, could you do it locally? Sure. I mean, uh, there's nothing magic about the drops that I'm compounding, um, but the problem is you go to your local doctor. First of all, they don't think they don't really sort of recognize the floaters are a problem. Uh, are a problem. They're not even seeing your floaters, um, and then you have to try to convince them, him or her, to write a prescription uh, for something that they've never really done before. Now, will they do? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, then you have this prescription, and you can't just go down to the local pharmacy. You have to then go to a custom compounding pharmacy that will do that for you. Well, it's really not complex. It's not difficult to do. It's not rare ingredients. I don't know if they have it in stock. They may have to order it. But um, just the fact that they have to do the, the compounding is going to make it fairly expensive. Well, you know, I mean, this whole project, this atropine project, you know, it has to be worth my time. My time is worth something. But I don't want to take advantage of people's uh, desperation, you know, and, 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 you know, I want to make this reasonably affordable, you know, uh, to where uh, you do the consultation, you do the trial, uh, if it works for you and you want to buy more, you can do that through my website. And the, the pricing will be, you know, treating both eyes, it'll come out to a little bit less than a dollar a day. You know, is that reasonable? I think that's reasonable. Um, most eye drops are going to cost more than that, uh, prescription eye drops. And when you think about what you pay for a coffee or this or that, I think it's pretty justifiable. I want to make it affordable. Um, and um, and and I'll, you know, for me, I can you know, say I'm able to do something for the younger patients, so it gives my practice a little bit more gravitas and makes more awareness of, of my practice and floaters and all that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty excited to, uh, to, to set this up. It has been a little, technically it's a little, been a little bit of a challenge. I've been doing it myself and I've been trying to get my website and my scheduling program and, uh, and, and PayPal and, and another program to trying to get all these things to kind of coordinate with each other. If I did this kind of stuff all the time, I'd be able to knock it out like that. But I think I have it, I think I have it up and running and I think it's, 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 it's going to uh, work okay. Um, there's definitely room for improvement, so anybody who participates in this, by all means, give me some feedback. Uh, you people who are a bit more tech savvy than I am, if you're like, you know, Skype is lousy, Zoom is better, or some other program is better, or have you considered this, please uh, help me out with this. There's a lot of smart people out there, and, uh, and I respect your experience, uh, and I'm willing to say, I want to learn, I want to get, I want to make the process better. You know, I want to make it more efficient, I want to make it better, I want to make it more streamlined. Uh, and the more streamlined it is for me, the less work it is for me as well, so that's good too. Um, so anyways, that's my announcement. Um, I am really excited to, to offer something new. It's been frustrating, like I said, to, to have to say, I can't do anything for you or don't even bother coming in. Well, uh, I think now I have something for you. So again, appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you've made it this far, thank you. I, my videos tend to be very lengthy, but I, hopefully it's information that you find valuable and helpful. And uh, just be mindful out there. I know there's a lot of frustration out there, and a lot of you think that, you know, and, and will actually say, and I've read it before, uh, read it on Reddit, um, you know, these doctors don't care, you know, they're, they, they don't get it, they're stupid, whatever. Um, I care. You know, I'm trying my best uh, to, to bring you a little bit of relief, and, um, you know, we just have only so many tools in the toolbox. But uh, so anyways, thank you, and uh, uh, give me some feedback on this, and uh, good luck, and stay safe out there. Uh, thanks for listening.